Kagurabachi is a miracle. Before this story even debuted, the hype and anticipation for what was seemingly just a simple story about a cool looking guy with a sword exploded across the internet. No matter where you went, you saw Kagurabachi memes, posts calling it the greatest series ever, and promises of it selling a Kagura billion dollars. Now, like most things that the internet hypes up, the actual source of the jokes and excitement paled in comparison to the myth that had been established. While not bad, the first chapter of Kagurabachi was extremely average. The art style was quite distinct and we got to see what would later be understood as the beginning of an interesting depiction of fights in manga. However, everything else was pretty bland, basic, and generally unimpressive. Chihiro was a standard edgy main character, the plot simple and even the established power system, something that we had seen countless times before. But then Kagurabachi did something that I didn't expect, something that many other mediocre starting shonen jump manga don't do. It got better. It got way way better. Slowly but surely, it started to find its footing within the narrative and its own distinguished voice. And in this video, I will not be asking whether or not Kagurabachi is living up to the hype. I'm sure you've seen many videos posing that question. Rather, I'm going to explain why it is currently living up to the unreasonable expectations placed upon it, and why if you aren't already, you should be on the lookout for Kagurabachi. The story of Kagurabachi has less than 20 chapters as of the release of this video, and what I have to say regarding its plot reflects that rather heavily. Of the three main aspects of the series I'd like to cover today, I'd argue that the plot is both the most basic and least developed part yet, but this isn't a criticism of the story per se. In fact, so long as the series is able to survive the ever-present Shonen Jump acts, Kagurabachi being a significantly slower and more methodically told story is the best thing that could ever happen to it at least as far as I'm concerned. Now, I'm not opposed to stories with much brisker pacing like Jujutsu Kaisen, Chainsaw Man, or Demon Slayer, but the art of the longer running battle shonen seems to be a lost one now, and while it's far too early to determine where Kagurabachi falls on this spectrum, I'll say that what I'm seeing so far isn't a terrible sign. For all those not in the loop, here's the long and short of it. Jihiro, the main character of the story, is the son of the world's greatest swordsmith and is currently on a path for revenge and retrieval of his father's blade. The katana that his father made were enchanted with unreal levels of power, enough so to put an end to an entire war, but unfortunately, the very power of those swords is what attracted some very, very negative attention. Because of this, Chihiro's father is killed and his legendary katana stolen, leaving our main character with one simple aspiration. Retrieve these swords at all costs and cut anyone down who stands in his way. Very basic, very clean, very uninspired if you want to view the plot in a more pessimistic light. And to be completely honest with you, I don't think that the first chapter does an amazing job of making you feel that the story will go in a unique or interesting direction, so I can't blame anyone for being skeptical in the beginning. Even now, several chapters into the manga, it feels like we are entirely within the first stage of the story. Sojo, one of hopefully many intimidating and engaging antagonists, has been introduced into the plot, and Chihiro has faced him and already built up resentment for him multiple times within this story, but out of the six swords that he hopes to recover, our main character has obtained zero. Now the plot is starting to unfold slowly before our eyes, and the path to retrieving these blades is becoming more and more visible, both for Chihiro and his allies, as well as us as the audience. However, for the most part, the main plot beats we've seen so far consist of what you would expect for a revenge and retrieval kind of story. On one hand, I think that Kagurabachi is actually executing on this well-trodden story type pretty well, and is at least doing the bare minimum to keep the audience engaged in what needs to happen next. On the other hand, I can sympathize with those who want Kagurabachi to be entirely unique or different with its intent, especially considering all of the hype it has been getting and actually received in the early stages of its reveal. With that being said though, if my hunch is correct about Kagurabachi and this story is approaching things with a bit more of a slow burn in mind, it honestly is moving in a way that many of the greats have. Bleach, One Piece, Naruto, and even Dragon Ball are all series that, within the context of today's manga market, would be considered painfully slow paced and dawdling in their writing style. Naruto is the fastest paced of the aforementioned manga, and 20 chapters in, we had only seen the first half of the Land of Waves arc. With Bleach, One Piece, and Dragon Ball, we honestly had barely even begun our hero's journey, much less found out the twist in it all. For a bit of context, 20 chapters into JJK, and we had already well been past the first arc of the series. I know it's a lot to ask, but I think patience with Kagurabachi's story will pay dividends in the future, and the 
reason I'm so confident in that claim is because this manga has already started to show itself as special through its characters and motivations. Takeru Hokozono, the author of Kagurabachi, really gets how to write compelling characters. More specifically, they know how to write an extremely engaging and fun protagonist-antagonist dynamic, as well as knowing how to fill the world around it to fuel that very relationship. Of the characters introduced into the story thus far, Chihiro, Sojo, Kunishige, and Char are my personal favorites. Chihiro is obviously the main character, and while I was initially under the impression that he would remain a one-dimensional edgy protagonist. Over the small amount of time that we've seen him so far, he's genuinely grown on me and had some of his layers revealed and peeled back to add to a layer of vulnerability and depth. In the first chapter, he is primarily conveyed as this very stoic, brooding, and angry young man on a path for vengeance. Now, in isolation, this character archetype is actually really, really cool, but only if it's paired with an actual three-dimensional writing style to back it up. And while I wouldn't say he's quite there yet with the greats, he's certainly being run through the 3D printer. Beneath his cold and calculating exterior, there's a ferocity and passion that is stemming from the trauma regarding his father's demise, and it's particularly difficult for Chihiro to contain in moments of intensity. And there's also a softness ever present within him that is quite reminiscent of the demeanor he had with Kunishige. Now, the very nature of his burden demands that he shut these less logical traits away and lock them deep inside of himself, but slowly he's being picked at by the other people within his world. Slowly, Chihiro is being forced to confront his humanity and emotions, and even utilize them as assets in his war against those who wield katana with evil intentions. Through placing Chihiro in uniquely adverse situations or forcing him to confront his own helplessness, Hokazono is able to take this once simple character and help him bloom into something more entertaining. My favorite characters in the story thus far are the primary reasons for this. Kunishige does this for us via flashbacks, and Sojo and Char in the current setting show us the more vulnerable aspects of our protagonist. When it comes to breaking the icy exterior of Chihiro, Char is the first character to step up to the plate and does so in a very pure very wholesome way. See, Char is a pretty simple character foundationally. She's a small child in desperate need of assistance, and that is really the premise. This type of character is obviously meant to garner sympathy from the people within the story, and we who are observing it, and she's intended to be where the emotion and heart of this manga really starts being infused. Even when being self-aware of this fact and somewhat on guard for it, Char absolutely succeeds in her purpose because she's so adorable. Her entire problem centers around her being chase and hunted to be experimented on, and this is a large part of why it's so easy to feel bad for her, but I'd be lying if I said that the way she acted didn't also endear me to her character significantly faster than her negative circumstances did. She has this uppity little way of talking to people that she should obviously have respect for. She's a glutton and will ask for food at every possible occasion, and even just the way she swings her arm around in this stupid oversized hoodie is so cute. If you have a sibling that's a lot younger than you, I think you'll understand what I mean on a personal level, but Char is very very much like a younger sister or cousin, and I think Hokazono really encapsulates this feeling well without being corny at all. It'd be very easy to overdo it or just fail to capture the proper tone of a young child in a manga like this, so I appreciate Char's wonderfully refreshing and adorable presence all the more because of it. And because of Char's heartwarming antics, Chihiro's protectiveness over her makes him a lot more likable. His quest to find his father's swords is more honorable and gives him a cool edge, but genuinely being enraged when she is in danger or putting his body on the line to protect her gives him a softness that most characters need to be well balanced, even if the author intends to go a little bit of a darker, more serious route with them. Think of some of the most edgy or dark characters you know, and ask yourself if they would work without the proper balance of dark and light moments. More often than not, the answer to that question will be no, and Char is able to reveal the light within Chihiro's heart, and that's really nice. To contrast this, Sojo, our main antagonist, does the exact opposite of Char. As his role may imply, he antagonizes Chihiro, and he does it really, really well. Every moment they have on screen together is electric in more ways than one, and a large part of that is due to the aura and menacing vibes that Sojo gives off. He's absolutely ruthless in his actions, which is enough to make you hate him off rip. He has a hint of mystery in regard to his origins, and then all of this is smothered in a thick layer of charisma to really tie these things together. This spread right here is very indicative of what I mean. On one side, you have Chihiro looking to fulfill his duty 
duties and retrieve one of his father's stolen blades. And on the other, you have Sojo egging him on, only here to fight and test his own abilities. The usually calm, cool, and collected Chihiro starts to drop that mask of stoicism the moment the source of his hatred is reintroduced and confronting him face to face. The refined blade of hatred that he wields superheats and starts boiling over. Once again, giving us an insight into another aspect of our protagonist. To add icing to the antag pro tag cake, Sojo also has an obsession with Kunishige, he also has an obsession with Chihiro's father, and he views his work with Katana as an explicit endorsement of violence and harm, something that further drives a wedge between their mentalities. And it's because of this very stark difference in every capacity that both Sojo and Chihiro are affected mentally by the other and hold a level of disdain for their counterpart. Their different understandings of Katana and what it means to wield them not only inform us about who they are, but it also makes these characteristics known to each other. The specific contrast helps them learn how to awaken their blades in unique ways and successfully grow in both scale and strength, but it also deepens the sense of animosity they have towards one another just that much more. Even amidst that hatred though, Chihiro's affection for Char is able to grab his attention. It's interactions like these that really lead me to believe that our protagonist is going to be a really, really solid character. Killing Sojo, retrieving his father's blades, and protecting the weak are oftentimes going to require conflicting actions, mentalities, or decisions, and I'm more than excited to see how Sojo forces him to grapple with these choices, as well as seeing how Chihiro responds in kind. Of my favorite characters in the story thus far though, I would say that Chihiro's father has easily had the most impact in regard to his humanization. Put simply, Kunishige is the foundation of the protagonist we see today, which makes every character trait that he has in the story now, at least for the most part, a byproduct of his father's influence, and the author's decision to regularly flash back to moments in their lives together directly displays just how much Kunishige was a part of Chihiro's life and just how influential every teaching that he gave him was. This much is very appreciated and it just goes to show rather than tell us how important Kunishige's teachings were to his son and how impactful his death was as well. Outside of these four characters, I would argue that Kagurabachi is still finding its footing. Shiba is a somewhat cool guy who I'm interested to see more of, and we've recently been introduced to a squad of fighters that may seem alright, albeit kind of injured or dead, but generally speaking, I think the cast outside of the core four are still in the oven. Anyways, let's close the more nerdy chapter of this video and jump into the real fun. Let's talk about the art and fights within Kagura Bachi. Kagura Bachi art is so good and it's actually so good it's really throwing me off. Anytime Chihiro unsheathes his sword and is ready to go to battle, I gotta sit up and lock in because I know some crazy artistic displays are right around the corner. It's somewhat difficult to put into words properly, but this manga has a very cinematic feel, not very similarly to Fujimoto in the way he tries to capture a very movie-esque atmosphere, but more in the things that Hokazono decides to focus on or how they decide to depict action. These spreads are just a few examples of what I'm talking about. In big moments like these, it really feels like everything is slowing down and bombastic action music is accompanying it. It handles its fights significantly different from manga like Jujutsu Kaisen and Sakamoto days, but I would argue that from a visual standpoint alone, it's still one of the most interesting manga in the magazine right now. Now I've talked about Sakamoto days and JJK when it comes to their fights at length, but where these two manga really excel are at depicting the in-between moments of a fight. The hand-to-hand -hand combat, the reaction of an attack, the micro-movement and expressions. Kagurabachi, in contrast, excels at the introduction and conclusion to a clash or big attack. Jihiro will unsheath his sword and be cloaked in darkness. He'll slash through a flurry of enemies and lack a bit of detail and precision, but then we get a spectacular panel or spread of the aftermath or the end of Jihiro's big move. That isn't to say that the choreography is bad, rather that the artistic purpose is entirely different and it's meant to invoke a different kind of feeling from the viewer. To make a long story short, we're essentially meant to view these fights as massive spectacles to gawk at, rather than necessarily look at it as an intricate dance that we're meant to understand, like the fighters themselves. It's an entirely different methodology from many manga I usually talk about, but it's an appreciated one nonetheless, and it certainly gives this series its own unique flair. The use of black and shading is absolutely phenomenal and so aesthetically distinct in a way that gives Kagurabachi its own visual identity. To do this so early on and really establish its own unique flair is something that I find genuinely impressive, and it's going to be useful for the 
the series moving forward. Simply put, Kagurabachi feels like Kagurabachi, and that is going to be integral if this manga plans on having a long stand shown and jump, and even beyond that, if it plans to be a series that makes an impact on the culture long term. Popular series are generally ones that can formulate their own identity, and while I think this manga is still in the process of doing this in a narrative sense, it has already made itself distinct when it comes to its approach to aesthetics. The scale of its fights also look quite promising for all those who care about that. I myself am certainly a fan of the more grounded style of fighting as opposed to world shattering attacks happening every single fight, but adding a hint of flair every now and then never hurt anybody, and it seems that this manga will have flair for days. As of right now, the power system isn't super deep or intricate, and I'm honestly not sure if the author ever intends to dive into that from that standpoint, but the abilities are explained rather concisely with little room for misunderstanding or misinterpretation, and this allows for the flow of combat to be steady and enjoyable. Out of everything that Kagurabachi does, it's fair to say that its art and fight stand out the most. This isn't to discredit its characters or plot, but when you have art that looks this good and a style that is this unusual and distinct on such a regular basis, it's going to be very, very difficult to not have it shine through as its best trait. Now, despite all of the praise and hype that I think Kagurabachi is worth, the manga is still in its infancy, which means that it has a lot of growing to do and a lot of popularity to gain if it wants to survive the all-cutting shonen jump acts. So everything I say in this video could be completely for naught within the span of a couple of weeks or months, but as of right now, I'm genuinely enjoying and rooting for this series. I'm enjoying the characters and I'm enjoying the fights, and when talking about new manga within this magazine, that's actually a very, very rare sight. As far as I'm concerned, Kagurabachi is living up to the hype, and if it wasn't on your radar before, I hope it is now. If you want to see more Kagurabachi content on the channel, let me know what you'd like to hear me talk about down in the comment section below, and subscribe for more videos like this. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you in the next one.